No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Um, Carl, particularly your last point about ROI, return on investment. When CED introduced that language into the uh, early education debate, I think it actually changed the dynamic. It was new uh, to the advocates. They actually welcomed it. Um, I suspect it's new to post-secondary education. They don't welcome it, um, but that's where we need to go. Um, as always, brilliant, inspiring. Thank you very much. We're a little behind, not by much, but I've asked Carl if he, he, you're, you'll be able to stay. And so at the general Q&A period after our panel, those of you who may have questions for Carl, um, he will still be here. I'm now going to introduce very quickly uh, Pat Cowan, who is the founding president of the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education, on whose board I was really honored to serve for a number of years. The best board meeting I ever attended, because I always learned Pat. Um, for those of you who know Pat, he has been a leader both at the state level and the national level in driving change in post-secondary education. The National Center for a number of years did a series of reports called Measuring Up Report Cards, made some states mad, made, made most states mad, um, because they weren't quite cutting it. And in fact, we uh, worked with Pat and used some of the National Center's uh, data from their Measuring Up series to launch CED's first report on post-secondary education a few years ago called Cracks in the Pipeline. Um, we are extremely honored to have Pat Callan as the project director for CED's subcommittee on post-secondary reform. As I said, he is a national leader in this area. You've got his full bio, and uh, Pat, I want to thank you for integrating your approach with CED's. Janet Hansen, our uh, vice president for education studies, uh, much against our uh, desires, uh, retired. Uh, earlier this year, Janet's uh, in the back of the room. I want to thank Janet for helping to launch this study, for staying with it, and also for working with Pat to get us where we are today. So please welcome Pat Callan, who will moderate the discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much, Charlie, and I am very pleased to be uh, associated with uh, CED in this uh, important effort, which is about finding uh, the right voice for CED and for the business community generally uh, to address these issues that uh, Hillary and uh, Carl laid out so well. So I think the sense you, I hope you, uh, you got from that, and I'm uh, going to move very quickly to our panel because uh, time is very short, but the, this in a sense is about higher education, but in a, in a broader sense it's really about the future of the country, it's about the future of the middle class, it's about America's ability to compete, and it's about whether we still have a society with opportunity and social mobility. All of that leads us to the issue of uh, productivity in higher education, which is a mountain we have to climb to get from, uh, to get from here to there. So I'm very pleased to uh, be able to turn this discussion over to uh, a very impressive panel, one that uh, they'll speak for five or six minutes apiece, and then we will have a little bit of time for questions, and I think Carl is sticking around for that too, right? So uh, let me introduce, uh, 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 with apologies, very briefly, so we can really move to the substance of this and, uh, and make up for a little time. Uh, our, our first uh, panelist, uh, Stan Latow, who is the uh, 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 um, Vice President for uh, Corporate uh, Citizenship and Corporate Affairs and President of IBM's Foundation, a distinguished career in both business and a philanthropy and also uh, uh, and also some roots in uh, education as well. So uh, we welcome, uh, welcome you as our first speaker, Stan. Thank you very much. I've got a brief um, presentation and I will uh, try to condense it uh, to get down to the recommendations uh, part of this. Uh, as you heard, I work for the IBM company. We're 100 years old. This is our centennial. We've had a lot of engagement and involvement in civic community affairs over the 100-year period. Um, I won't go into much of it. I hope you know a lot about uh, what we've done for a 100-year period. One of the things I will say is that uh, our second CEO, Tom Watson, 
opened the IBM plant in Lexington, Kentucky, which became Lexmark Computers. It was the first integrated manufacturing plant in the United States of America below the Mason-Dixon line, and it resulted in the integration of the schools in Lexington, Kentucky. So if you're looking for ways that the private sector could influence uh, public policy, that's but one example. It took place about 10 years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Now, in terms of what we do from a corporate citizenship standpoint, as is the, you mentioned in the introduction, I have a little bit of background in education. I was deputy chancellor for schools here in New York City uh, back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. A lot of us in the private sector don't have a full appreciation of how difficult it is uh, to make change in the uh, public sector. It is possible in government and in education to drive change. But as we learn in the private sector, it's almost impossible to drive change in any enterprise unless you understand it first and figure out what are the levers for change. So we've been doing a number of things through our citizenship activities in education. We invented a new early childhood learning center that serves about uh, 15 million children through these uh, Kid Smart Learning Centers, invented a new way to teach children to read using voice recognition technology, created a lot of uh, content on the web for science teachers, uh, for people in K-12 to to improve their education. If you have questions about any of those things afterwards, I'd be happy to answer them. In terms of moving forward, uh, we have a corporate service corps, which is, I uh, heard a reference to the Peace Corps earlier. I, I call it the private sector version of the Peace Corps, where we take our top executives and employees and send them out in teams in the developing world to make change on the ground, much as uh, the Peace Corps did, but do it through uh, community service activities, Smarter Cities Challenge, which uh, deploys uh, our best talent to help cities make themselves smarter, and in terms of our centennial to get everybody involved in service. But what I'm here to talk about are things that are of real value in terms of business leadership in the area of education. And you've heard some of these facts before, so I'm not going to go over them more, but college graduates out earn high school graduates by 84%. High school graduates' lifetime earnings translate to just $15 an hour. 63% um, of American jobs will require post-secondary education or training by 2018. Tom Friedman, in his recent column, talked about uh, to get into the middle class now, you have to study harder, work smarter, adapt quicker. He talks about there not necessarily being a jobs crisis, but a skills crisis. So, you know, but only 41% of Americans hold a bachelor's degree. Only 30% of college students finish it. From the standpoint of community colleges, which we focused a lot of attention on, 26% of those who register in community college get their two-year degree at the end of six years. In some cities, like Chicago, they have Chicago City Colleges, 7% of the students who register in one of the seven City colleges in Chicago get their two-year degree at the end of six years. You've heard this earlier. It's a crisis. It's a crisis that is really significant and substantial. Now the question is, what does the business community do about it? Uh, and I think we've heard earlier, link education and skills to the job market and find new ways to provide solutions. I will hold out one suggestion. We at IBM, partnering with the City University of New York, and the Department of Education started a new model school here in New York City in Brooklyn. It's called Pathways in Technology Early College High School. A lot of, a lot of words, we call it PTEC. It opened across the street from uh, Albany Houses in Brooklyn, central Brooklyn. It is a grade nine through 14 school. We revised the curriculum working with the CUNY faculty and the Department of Education faculty to make sure that each course was connected to the Common Core Standards, which were referred to earlier, but also connected directly to the skills required in the workplace. Every student at the school gets a IBM mentor, every teacher at the school gets an IBM mentor, and the principal is being mentored by our Senior Vice President for Technology, uh, Rod Atkins. At the end of the first two months since the school opened, it has 99% attendance. There was no screening in this school, so every student from central Brooklyn who wanted to apply for it got in, and they did, and about um, a third of the students have significant reading problems. On the other hand, we do believe it is possible through an integrated grade 9 to 14 approach to get more kids a 
community college degree, the ability to be first in line for jobs at IBM and other IT uh, companies, and to significantly increase the graduation rates. So we spent a lot of time in this discussion talking about the problem. Here's one solution. When America came out of the Second World War, we changed education by saying we were going to mandate high school. Before that, most school districts offered high school, but you could leave at the end of an eighth grade with an eighth grade education. High school was not mandatory. And by making high school mandatory, you can argue, in addition to a whole lot of other things, we made America more competitive, we created more knowledge workers, and we drove increases and in improvements in the American economy coming out of the Second World War. Maybe it is time to consider a revised approach in how we talk about education and skills going forward. The P-TECH model, number one, mastery, grade 9 to 14. After this was announced, Mayor Rahm Emanuel announced he was going to open five of these schools on the grade 9 to 14 model in September of 2012 and commissioned a study to look at all of the community colleges, all of the K-12 programs in Chicago and economic development come up with a roadmap to change education in Chicago. We've also heard from other mayors, I think it's 43 of them, interested also in the idea of this mastery model. Second, make sure that graduates receive a high school diploma and the post-secondary degree that's required to get a job. At IBM, we have more jobs at $40,000 and above for students with associate's degree in computer science than any other company. And as was referred to earlier, those jobs can stay here in the United States if we have people with those skills. The curriculum needs to be mapped to prepare graduates to enter the workforce and pursue higher education. That's not rocket science. We've looked at it and mapped it through a variety of other companies, and you can incorporate those skills into the program in high schools beginning in grade nine. Each student, as I said, is assigned an IBM mentor. There are a lot of companies that are engaged and involved in this. A lot of the tools to be able to help build the capacity of your mentors and activate them can be done electronically. And students get workplace experiences in school and not separate from their academic career, but tied directly into it. And there's a possibility of doing a lot of this through co cooperative education programs and the like. In higher education, we have a program that began in the 1960s uh, that provided college students with the financial wherewithal to complete their education called the College Work Study Program. It's $1.2 billion. It serves 800,000 students around the US, but they work in cafeterias, libraries, and a variety of other tasks. That $1.2 billion, those 800,000 students could work and refine their skills in things that are related to continuing their education in the workplace, and it wouldn't cost the United States one more cent. Now, P-TECH is a blueprint and it doesn't have to be exclusive to the IT industry. It can work in a variety of other areas, healthcare, finance, you name it. And we know that over the next 10 years in the United States, there are going to be 14 million jobs created for students with these kind of degrees. We can keep them in the United States. We can provide the kinds of work and living wage that people need by adopting this kind of a model. Uh, the President of the United States talked about it in his speech earlier this month. Mayor Bloomberg talked about it on Meet the Press. They referenced this, the IBM P-TECH City University Department of Education model as one that might fuel more jobs and more economic opportunity in the future. And I would suggest that it's something that we really ought to consider now. If you want to find out more about it, uh, check the uh, links. But uh, as I said, we've been in business for 100 years. We like to think that we can solve business problems. We're a hundred billion dollar company, 425,000 employees. And if we don't devote some time and attention to solving this problem, we'll be the worse off. Thank you very much.